So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the November virtual Cup of Joe with Paul. And today we have special guests, Amherst Finance Director, Sean Mangano, and Amherst Comptroller, Sonia Aldrich, joining us to talk about budget and finance. Welcome everybody, good morning. Good morning. I wanna give a chance for maybe Paul to do any report outs as well as our special guests to introduce themselves and report out on anything that they might wanna share before we get to questions. Sure. So <clears throat> thanks everybody for being here. This is um, a cup of Joe. So you can talk about anything. We happen to bring some guests along because it's usually boring just talking to me and Brianna, but you know, um, so that's why we have Sonia and, and Sean here. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk a, a lot about budget. Obviously we pretty much just began our budget process in the last couple of weeks. And uh, Sean can talk a little bit about how the budget uh, process works out uh, over time. And, um, and just answer whatever questions people have. And while, uh, while we're on the topic of asking questions, I just wanna remind everyone how you can do so. If you've joined us from the phone, you can press star nine and that'll indicate to us that you have a question or you may put a question into the Q and A um, within Zoom or raise your hand within Zoom and we will bring you into the room. So now I will ask our special guests to just introduce themselves, tell, tell the room and the viewers who you are and any updates you might have. Sonia, would you like me to start? Sure. <laughs> John Mangano, I'm the finance director. I've been here since May, and before that I was with the schools for a while. Um, I know Paul said he brings guests along so that it's not boring. I don't know if Sonia and I are gonna, are gonna <laughs> achieve that goal, but we'll do our best. Um, I think at some point, maybe not right now, but we'll do updates on the FY22 budget process and um, where we're at. Should we do it right now, Paul, or maybe wait till? Yeah. Bit... Let's hear from Sonia, see who, see who she is. Who's this new woman here? She's oh, new oh. to the job, I think. I'm Sonia Aldrich, and I've been working for the town for 34 years, probably more than all of you collectively, honestly. No question about that. Um, and I don't really have a whole lot to say. I'm, I will say in public that I am grateful to have Sean Mangano on our team. It's been a great addition. So it gives me the opportunity to say that. Yeah. Because you were wearing two hats for a long time, um, finance director and comptroller, and just carried the town through the hardest You're parts of it. So. so I'm really glad Sean <laughs> <You're tired. is> here. <laughs> I'm really happy to have him. All right, well, welcome you both. And we thank you both for being here to, to liven it up a little bit. Um, as Paul said, people are probably tired of seeing um, our just our faces. So um, I wanna remind, there's a couple new people who've joined the room. Please feel free to put your questions into the, the Q&A within Zoom or raise your hand within Zoom so we can hear from you live. We'd love to, we'd love to do that. Um, I know we kind of packaged this um, this meeting with the, promoting the budget forum last night. Is there any updates or information on how that went? Yeah, do you want me to give an update, Paul? Sure. So the we did our financial indicators presentation on Monday, which is um, sort of a general kickoff to the budget process that uh, provides information about where the town is at financially. And then following up on that on uh, last night, we had our budget forum, which is a requirement of the charter. And we gave an abbreviated presentation of what we did on Monday night and we heard from probably six or seven people, I'd say, Paul, um, last night. Eight. Eight, eight people. I took notes on everybody, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we, we got some good, um, you know, sort of the first chance to really give feedback on the FY22 budget. Um, we got some good input into that. Um, and there will be other opportunities as we go forward. Uh, one of the things I noted last night is we post information on our website under, uh, if you go to the government tab at the top and then click on budget, um, there's an FY22 tab on that page. And I'm sure at some point, Brianna will probably post a budget link right on the home page um, so people can get to it quickly. Um, but also on that page is a budget feedback button. So if anybody wants to submit input um, that way without coming to a meeting, if they just want to send in their thoughts, that, that feedback gets back to Paul and I. So um, next, really, next steps for the budget process is the finance committee and the the town council will develop budget guidelines for um, the town manager to de develop this budget. So that's where we're at right now. 
Yeah, I just want to note that, you know, what the town of Amherst does is really a model for how you're supposed to do things. So we start everything with the financial indicators, which is really a the gathering of the elected officials, which is the town council, the um, board of library trustees and the school committee. And then the town um, staff who are the experts in finance, Sean, Sean and Sonia, will, and, and I make a presentation saying, here's where we are, here's what it looks like over the past 10 years, so you can start to see trends. And so we share all the financial information and all that information goes on to our website. Then we move to the next phase and say, well, what do people, what are the people's values that they're bringing um, to the to what would they like to see the budget to reflect? And then with that information, the town council then starts to work on budget guidelines, which then comes to me as uh, I start, we start to build the budget and I look at those guidelines along with the goals that the town council has set. And then we build our budget to meet the goals and those budget guidelines that the town council has set. So it, there's a really logical sequence of events that we follow. Um, it's very arduous. There's a lot of, um, it is a very iterative process. We're reporting back a lot and uh, listening to a lot and doing a lot of listening. It's really different than almost every other city in town, quite honestly. And I've worked in, in others and worked at the State Municipal Association. So it's really a model for public engagement and sort of a process that's really heavy on the process. So, you know, I think the townspeople should feel really good about, their, about where we are today and how we're moving forward, even in these pandemic times. All right. Well, thank you for the update on on the current um, or, or upcoming budget year. So one of the questions we had is what about our um, update on last fiscal year and how um, did we survive the pandemic budgetarily speaking and any trends that um, either of you noticed? Sonia, do you want to give an update on last year? Um. Well, for anybody that wants to see uh, how we ended up last year, they can go onto the accounting page. And I'm not sure if you posted it on last year's budget page, but there's the fourth quarter report. And that pretty much shows how we ended up for fiscal year. We did really well considering um, the revenues that we lost. We lost about $450,000 in um, revenue last year, but we returned on almost or a little over $2 million in operational expenses. And a lot of that was um, possible because of the CARES Act funds that we received to help us offset a lot of expenditures. And um, operations just weren't happening the way they normally happen in a normal year. So that offset that and allowed us to add another um, about one point, about one and a half million to our free cash, which puts us in a really good spot to start off for fiscal year 22, uh, 21 actually. So we did really well. So anybody that wants any more detailed information on that, go to that report. It's pretty informative. Yeah, so we didn't do a lot of things. You know, we didn't, LSSC you know, wasn't running recreation programs. We didn't have the, you know, the police and fire expenses that we typically have during a busy spring. Um, there's very, there was pretty much no overtime. Um, and so we, our expenses were way down, but on the other flip side of that, our, our revenues were down. Parking wasn't coming in at all. Our water fees were down and sewer fees. So, you know, our revenues were down, but our expenses were down too. And I think Sonia's put right on the CARES Act fund. So that was really critical. That's federal money that came through the state to the town. And that anything that connected, and Sean's been running this, this multi-million dollar pot of, of funds available. Um, anything that could be attributed to COVID, um, we would take out of that that fund balance. Yeah, and what I, what I tend to leave off, I'm always talking about the general fund and should have said something about the enterprise funds too. Those took a pretty decent hit to their revenues because you mass closed and there was less water usage, which also affects sewer, use, sewer um, rates and transportation and parking revenues have not, obviously we weren't ticketing and we weren't um, taking in parking revenue. So that hit our transportation fund pretty hard as well. And we have an observation from the room that Cherry Hill Golf Course made a boatload of money. <laughs> yeah, that was, one of the, that was one of the ones that we were worried about how they would do. And I think they end up having one of their best years um, because that was one of the few things that people could actually do was go outside and golf. Um, 
And the other thing on Cherry Hill, we, we didn't hire any temporary staff this year because of, because of the pandemic. We repurposed existing staff. Um, and so that really helped Cherry Hill as well on the expenditure side because we, we didn't incur additional costs. We, we spread out our, our existing ones. Um, so yeah, Cherry Hill, by what I've heard, has had a pretty good year. And there was a drought, <laughs> which was bad for everything else except Cherry Hill because it's a beautiful day every day. And how does that compare to some of the other offerings under Amherst Recreation or LSSC, I guess, as formerly known as LSSC? <laughs> I think some of the other ones did not do quite as well. Um, I know they, they had to make some modifications to some of their programming and, and they were doing some things remotely. Um, but I think Cherry Hill was really the, the one that stuck out. I think the pool did fairly well. I'm not sure what the pool, um, what the number of people that went to the pool, but I know they were able to keep the pool open um, and same thing sort of limit the additional staffing because of the pandemic and keep that as an option for the community. Another observation in the room, um, just as we got talking about pools, um, they, they say, I think the pools did well also. So it sounds like that was true. And I have um, a hand up in the room. So I'm going to invite um, Ken to come on in and unmute and introduce yourself, please. Thank you. This is Ken Rosenthal. I live at 53 Sunset Avenue. At the planning board meeting the other night, there was some discussion about changes in town as we looked at the possibility of altering our zoning bylaw. And uh, over time, the center of town in particular has changed in ways that are, are not totally compatible with, I think, what many of the long-term residents here uh, favor. But this pandemic is causing major dislocations in our economy. My children who live remotely uh, distant from New York City are finding that people are retreating from the urban areas in New Jersey and New York and buying up properties in their small towns. And um, we used to have uh, in, in the center of town residences on the second, third, and sometimes where there are fourth floors in the buildings in the middle of town. Now they're offices, they used to be residences. Uh, with the changing uh, ways that we work and more working from home, I'm wondering whether you see any evidence yet that Amherst is going to become a residential destination for people who are able to work more from home. And that, of course, will alter the, the need for housing in town, but may also alter the need for services in town. We've got 47 restaurants and bars within a mile or so of the University of Massachusetts. Some of them used to be stores. CVS used to be a supermarket. A restaurant used to be a, a shoe store. We, I know we can't compete with, with Route 9 businesses, but more residences, re residents will bring different kinds of demands for services and, and products in the middle of town. And I'm wondering if you see any of this starting to happen now. Well, um, we're not sure, but like what we do know is that residential values are extre extremely high. Properties are going in the market and being bought very quickly. The, the real estate market is very robust. We have people just clamoring for properties to purchase. And I think part of it, Ken, is just what you said. People are saying, are saying I can work anywhere it's under this new reality. I don't have to live in commuting distance of New York City or Boston. I can be someplace that has a good school district and, and all the outdoor amenities that we have, plus a, a vibrant downtown. Um, how it's going to play out in terms of our downtown area, it's really not, not certain. I think, um, you know, we sort of, you know, there used to be residences and there are offices and now they may go back to residences downtown. There are challenges for our older buildings and transitioning to any kind of new use because most of them don't have elevators and putting in elevators is a gigantic challenge and uh, makes it very hard economically to make that, that work. Um, I don't know, Sean, Sonia, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, the one thing I'll add, and this really started pre-pandemic, but it'll be interesting to see if it continues, is that we have seen a lot of development just in Amherst in general. Mm -hmm. our, our new growth numbers, um, so new growth is how much we add to the tax rolls each year um, from new developments or uh, improvements to, to existing properties. Um, for the past couple of years, that's been pretty high and has been doing really well. Um, and this past year was pretty strong too. So um, we track that number every year as an important indicator of you know just what's going on and out there on the and for our properties so 
um, that's a number we can track going forward to see if anything new is coming on. I mean, one of the things I feel is that um, when we do, I think the town is going to be very resilient and that we're, when it comes time, when the pandemic passes, we're going to bounce back quicker than most places because we have two, the, you know, the yeah. university and two colleges sort of has, they have concrete in the ground. They're not going anywhere. Those fundamentals won't change. There will still be students on those campuses. There'll still be tuitions being paid. Um, and so the businesses that support those res those those industries uh, will still be there. And just as a side note, congratulations, former intern president of Hampshire College for a gigantic $5 million gift uh, that was given to the, the college. And uh, if people don't know, Ken had been a longtime leader of Hampshire College, the uh, staff historian, um, as it were, and also uh, was the interim president during a very critical time that really helped stabilize the college. And this week, the president, uh, the new president announced a $5 million gift, which is, I think, Ken, the largest gift or the second largest gift the college ever had? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Hampshire alum Paul Bachelman, for saying <laughs> those nice things. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the second largest gift since the very first years of the college, Harold Johnson's gift that made the college possible. But uh, j just to stay on this subject for just one, one minute longer, yes, when the colleges and university reopen, and, the, and, and again, the, the, the demand for housing in town meets what if we suspect will happen with people wanting to come to this very desirable community now to work from home, then I have one more worry. And that is that we continue to drive out of town the people who work and live here because the house, housing costs rise too fast. So just my last word is a pitch for housing that's affordable enough so that we can keep the people who work in town able to walk to work, able to live in the town where they work. That's always, I think, our ideal is to live where we work. And um, we have private organizations trying to do this. We also can do so through zoning. And I hope we keep that in mind as we do the planning for the town. And thank you for listening to me this morning. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. So I just want to take a moment. I do see that we've got some um, folks in the room, and I'm not going to put them too much on the spot, but I'd love to offer if you want to come in and say a few words just to raise your hand and I will let you in and that's Council President Lynn Griesmer and we also have LSSC Commission Chair Sarah Marshall in the room if either of you have anything you want to say about your work please feel free to raise your hand and I will um, pull you into the room if not no worries we'll give them a chance to think about that so. oh there's Lynn's hand so just a moment while I'm All right, Lynn, you're in the room with us if you want to unmute. Thanks. Uh, first of all, happy Thanksgiving, but be safe and with masks and distancing and washing hands. Um, first, I want to really um, point out something that I think sounded a little subtle, and I just don't want it to be subtle, and that is we did come through the COVID uh, first phase, if you will, ending in June um, in good financial shape. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, we have money to burn. It just means we came through in good financial shape. And that is really to the credit of Paul and Sonia and uh, Sean and the whole team of financial people. You know, and as we look to the next year, we know that there's tensions around the budget and we know that there's demands on the budget and we really want to hear from people. We want to hear from people in terms of how um, they see us spending money, what services are most valuable to you, um, what services you want to make sure we are still doing, you know, five years from now. So uh, please join in every opportunity to um, talk with us about the budget and there'll be plenty. Thank you. I'll just go back out of the room. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for popping in and saying hello. All right. We have a, um, another question here that we've gotten a bunch over the last I want to say year. Um, so our, our four major capital projects, is there any update on what's happening with them? Um, where, where are we with, with that process? So the four major capital projects are the, uh, an L, a new element, elementary school, renovations to the Jones Library, 
a new DPW facility and a new fire headquarters. And those are have been on the table for a long time. Um, the town hasn't built a new building in over 30 years. Typically a town like us, given the number of buildings we have, you'd expect it to be, to be a major renovation or building every 10 years, which sort of sequence out and lets you manage your debt load. The town hasn't done that. And so we have this big backlog of major capital projects that we're facing. Um, we were fortunate to be admitted into the Mass School Building Authority uh, program, which will fund a, a major portion of a new elementary school. That's a very detailed, long process, multi-year process. Sean has been through it before, has served on a building committee. He's on the building committee again. Um, and Councilor Kathy Shane is chairing that building committee um, as we move forward. Um, but that's, that's we, we sort of marched to the beat of the MSBA in that process. And that's the biggest, and, and I think for the council and the community, that's the highest priority for us right now. And that's moving forward. Um, the Jones Library has received a 15 plus million dollar grant from the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. And that sort of um, uh, prop propelled that into a the conversation very early on because it was a grant that we had to use or lose basically. And so the council is now looking at all the um, numbers and the options around the Jones Library to determine what it wants to do with that in, in conjunction with the Board of Library Trustees. Uh, the biggest conundrum for us has been the DPW and the fire. Um, everybody knows, like almost without a doubt, that the best location for a new fire headquarters is at the DPW site, which is on South Pleasant Street. Most people don't even know where the DPW is because it's kind of hidden from the road. Um, all the studies that we have done <clears throat> indicate that the um, South Amherst isn't as well served and that moving the central fire station a little bit farther south would serve both the downtown and South Amherst better. So that's the location, but then it's then the question becomes, what do you do with a public works facility? And it's really, really, really hard to locate a public works facility for two reasons. One, a lot of people don't want a, what would be called an industrial um, site in their neighborhoods. Um, and secondly, it needs a lot of land because there's just a lot of trucks and movement and piles of sand and, and salt and things like that, that that have to be accommodated there. Um, and it's a 24 hour operation. So, and, and the other thing is that the town doesn't have that much land that's not developed. Um, and so it's, it's been a real challenge. We had one site that we looked at that the Amherst College had offered us, um, but the neighbors in that neighbor, in that area really, and I think the council ultimately decided that members, that it wasn't the appropriate location. So we're struggling with finding a location for the DPW. And But the council had a retreat last Saturday and pretty much, um, you know, put, sent out the message that we need to move on these projects. And that's, that's our mission right now. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, we all want to do the projects and one of the challenges is financing all those projects and yeah. coming up with a, with a you know, way to afford all of them. And so that's one of the big challenges for us the next year or two is coming up with a financial plan um, that allows us to do that. So like in the capital improvement program, which is sort of part of the budget process, it'll, it'll be in the spring. Um, that's one of the areas we're going to aim to address is what, how can we afford all four of these projects over the next five to 10 years? Um, and I'm confident there's a way to do it, but it will mean we have to operate within our fiscal realities um, in terms of what we spend. And Paul, when we were originally kind of having this conversation about the, the capital projects, we had a pretty robust outreach and engagement process. Do you envision something similar happening again um, or in the next Sorry. iteration? Yeah, I, th I think the, the the conversations at the council level at this point in time, you know, it's it's up to staff to come up with some options in terms of how all the finances fit together, and that's what what our mission is at this point. Um, the council did do a pretty um, robust outreach, as you mentioned, before the pandemic, where we had lots of meetings. We had a facilitator come in and do a lot of listening, so that information is gathered. Um, but I think when the actual decision comes to be made. Um, there'll be a lot of public input at that point in time, I think. And we've got a question here from the room um, from Phyllis in South Amherst. When will a permanent bridge be constructed on Station Road? So um, 
we received a grant uh, from the state to support part of a bridge. And, you know, the, the temporary bridge seems to be working well. People actually, a lot of people tell us don't change it because they like it because it makes cars slow down. Uh, it's a one lane bridge and there's a process where you can, it, it can allow one, it, it's two way traffic up into the bridge and then you take turns crossing the bridge and it's station road doesn't have that much traffic to begin with. Um, but ultimately it will have to be replaced. We did get a grant, um, but that only uh, will cover a portion of the bridge. So we're looking at that, how we're gonna manage that. Uh, the bridge, the temporary bridge will last a very long time. We're not, there's no danger in it, but ultimately it'll have to be changed. Now, the thing that's gonna be sort of jarring to people, I think, is that when you replace the bridge, it's gonna be a lot bigger than what's there now, just because of environmental concerns and the, the span that we have to cross. So it's gonna be, I think people are gonna get a little, um, uh, stunned by how big the bridge is going to look and whether they really want that or not is going to be a big question. But it's going to be, the t be especially if the state is helping to fund it, it's what it's going to have to look like. Yeah, and Paul, I believe this is the one that we're also applying for another grant for. Yes. Um, the, uh, a FEMA grant to help us um, pay for some of it as well because it's an, it'll be an expensive project for the full replacement. Yeah. So I just want to remind, I see some new folks in the room, um, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question or pop it into the Q&A or star nine from your phone. So another question we have here is, what are the, the biggest challenges going forward for the FY21 budget year and beyond? Sure, so I, I can start with a few. Um, you know, we say this over and over again, so it's starting to, in my head, be very redundant, but maybe not for everybody, um, but just the amount of uncertainty that we are dealing with is, as we develop our budgets and, and make projections. Um, normally there's a, you know, a small amount of uncertainty with certain areas, but um, really most of our budget, and at least on the revenue side, there's a great deal of it, whether it's state aid and what the state will do with its budget next year and what the impact of the pandemic will be. Um, what the university and colleges will do in the spring and, and next year, whether we'll be back to full strength, um, how long it'll take for the downtown to kind of rebound and parking parking revenues to come back. So there's just really across the board, there's a lot of uncertainty because of the pandemic um, and when we'll get back to normal. So I'd say that's that's the biggest challenge right now, um, at least in terms of budgeting and, and, and projections is the, the level of uncertainty. So Sonia, and you've been here over three decades. What does this time compare to any other time that you can remember? What, what were other challenges to put this in context? I I think the um, the recession back in uh, twenty I don't I don't even know the year anymore was challenging, but um, not like this. This is, I mean, that was just totally budgetarily. This is where the state made, made mid-year cuts in our budgets. Right, right, right. Yeah, I really don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I, that seemed hard. This is, you know, people are scared for their health. Mm -hmm. scared for a lot of things. and So it's not just financial. That's interesting. Right, yeah. right. So I'd say coupled with the, the um, health issue with the mm -hmm. financial. And how it's disrupted our operations. I mean, we've really yeah. changed all the things that we do, you know, people working remotely and mm -hmm. new sort of safeguards in our building to let mm -hmm. people be able to work safely when they come in the building right. and, it's, and worried about people getting it in, in the building and what does that do to our operations? I think employees have been really um, terrific, mm -hmm. you know, with their own insecurities and everything and offering to help, um, help out and come in and it's been great. We have great employees. We're gonna send this recording to them later so they can <laughs> so they can hear the, all these nice things we're saying about them. So, so Sonia is usually known as, as the person who has to say no to a lot of people. <laughs> Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I don't. But just so you know, she does appreciate everybody. I do, a lot. So we have um, a question here. The semester kind of just is winding down at UMass and, and it looks like classes won't resume until February 1st. 
And so this question is about what's what's the impact on the town's revenues um, and subsequently budget for, you know, when the students are gone or is, is there any big impact? Yeah, um, so the, the biggest, the most noticeable one was our water and sewer fund. And just when you have, you know, however many students, 10,000 or, you know, more that aren't in town consuming water and sewer, that has a large impact on the, um, on the revenues that go into our water and sewer fund. On the flip side, if they were here this year, we probably would have had challenges with our water supply because as Paul mentioned earlier, we had, you know, we didn't have a lot of rain this summer. So um, it's sort of, you know, good and bad. Um, but there's also just an impact on our downtown and, you know, restaurants and, and businesses and parking and things of that nature um, from just having so many fewer people in town for such a long period of time. Do we see that getting any better over the holiday season? So probably not over the holiday season, maybe in the spring with the estimates that I've heard um, of the colleges and universities bringing back more students, not all of them, but more students, we would look to see some of the, our, um, some of our revenues start to rebound a little bit then. We've got a question here from the room. Um, Sarah asks, do we anticipate any water restrictions in the spring? Um, well, we, it's, it's hard to judge. We don't, I don't think so. Um, at <clears throat> Atkins Reservoir has been recovering quite well. Um, and we're making repairs to one of our wells that had to be uh, fixed up. With the um, depopulation of the campuses, it really wasn't much of a challenge uh, this year. But you know, we're always paying attention to this. We, and when I first started in 2016, there was a real concern about water with the university and the colleges. And the town has had this experience previously to where they had to actually ask all the college students to go home in the middle of the semester. Um, but, you know, it depends on the amount of snow and we are noticing, you know, it's hard to reckon, you know, I, I, uh, attribute any one thing to climate change, but it just seems that there are some things that we're sort of noticing a little bit more and more frequently. Um, but if we can, we monitor Atkins Reservoir, which are our major surface water source, and we have five wells as, as well, and during, mostly around the Lawrence Swamp. Um, and so with all those sources, I think we're, we generally are in pretty good shape. One thing I'd like to mention is like yesterday was, it was sort of a funny day. We had more meetings yesterday. I think it was the biggest meeting day of our, you know, we had, um, you know, we had the CPA committee making decisions. We had um, the first meeting of the community safety working group. Uh, the town council had two, one or two meetings going on and um, we had the human rights commission meeting and there was, and I think zoning board, I mean, there's just like all these meetings and typically we get, um, there's a stranglehold over rooms like, oh, you can't meet tonight because the zoning board is in the town room, so you have to pick another night. But with Zoom, we have limitless rooms in essence. So all these things are happening at the same time and, and counselors and people are just like jumping from room to room to room. Uh, it's just really kind of, you know, a lot's getting done and, and because people are being more efficient. Um, there were 11 public meetings yesterday. Paul. Really? Yeah. There, I have a calendar and there's just a big overlap of what else was going on. There's a dog park. Was there a dog park? There? Yes, there was yeah. a dog park. There was the budget forum, human rights, That's right, Commission, the budget forum. CPAC, TAC, and oh, community preservation act committee. I have to be better with my acronyms, transportation yeah. advisory, license commissioners, mm. town services and outreach committee, your community safety working group, participatory budgeting and rank choice voting commission. So and lots. That's which yeah, one day. That was great. And I know you were presenting to the council, um, Brianna, for some a proposal. And um, and so you know, I just want to make a plug for the community safety working group. It was it was a if you can find the recording of that, um, and I'm not sure if it's up yet, uh, but we'll get it'll probably go up today or within a week, I'm sure. Um, but it was an opportunity for the people who've been appointed to introduce themselves. It was really powerful to spend a little time listening to, to all the seven members who are the, on the committee um, to sort of introduce themselves and why they were interested. It's, it's one of the most exciting groups that uh, the town has created in, in my time here. And once the video is up, there'll be a dedicated playlist for that um, for that committee and all other committees that are recording their meetings, and it will be linked on their um, 
committee web page. So actually, that's something worth talking about, too. And normally we don't record all these meetings. It's usually under our contract with Amherst Media. They have to cover the, the school committee, the um, town council and the planning board, I think. And nothing else would get recorded. But now everything is right. We're recording everything. We are, by and large, recording everything. Um, I think so, it's up to the discretion of some boards. Um, I don't know if the trustees of the library are recording, but we have upwards of 50 hours per of meetings, of public meetings per week happening in town. Um, and they're all taking place on Zoom and for the most part being recorded and put on our YouTube channel. Um, <clears throat> so we're seeing exponential increase in viewership on our YouTube channel you know, by five, 600% over last year, because we have so much content um, available there. So basically everything that's happening is being recorded and, and put it up on our channel. Including so this. Including this and including our Amherst community chats. Um, basically anything that we can record, we're, we're putting up there and out there. So we're seeing a lot, lot more people accessing the information, maybe not in real time, although that has increased as well, um, live attendance and meetings. Um, since we've become virtual, but also post meeting viewership is up in, you know, so exponentially compared to last year. So, so you may have like eight people watching live, but then at the end of two weeks, you'll see, oh, 90 people actually watch the, the meeting over time, which is what we're, because people don't have to, it's not appointment TV. You can watch it, you know, at your leisure. And I, as, some and as I say, in some cases, Amherst Media will pick up some of our content mm -hmm. and actually play it on their channel or cross post it to their YouTube channel. So there's a lot of different ways that our um, information is getting out there now. So, so one of the things that came up at Community Safety was one of the members said, we'd really like to have a meeting. And this comes up really frequently, Brianna. Uh, we'd like to have a meeting where everybody can see each other. It feels awkward to do it the way we do this. Can you talk? And I know we've explored lots of different ways of modifying it and things. And I know that we've been Zoom bombed, but do you want to talk a little bit from the IT perspective? Because um, why we do it the way we do this? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I just want to acknowledge that I do see Lynn's hand. So I'll, I'll call on you, Lynn, and bring you in the room in just a moment. Um, so for this, it, it's a really fine balance between, you know, creating a safe and private environment for um, a safe environment for our meeting attendees and the public who are watching, as well as our, our panelists and our board members. Um, so. The, the current best practice is for us to, you know, in terms of public meetings, to keep as much security as possible um, in order to um, kind of match up with what the, the flow of an in-person meeting would be, which is observance with some um, prescribed public comment period. So in, in the terms of public meetings, we've been a little um, bit erring on the side of caution in terms of how we conduct the meeting and how participants are um, able to be seen or viewed. Um, you know, with, with some more community-based meetings, we've been able to be a little bit more um, lax in those terms because of this, the, the standards are a little different. So in some community-based meetings, we will set it up as a meeting and invite everybody in to, to, to be seen. Um, and sometimes that requires pre-registration. Um, and so we've been trying to make sure that there's as few barriers as possible, but it's as safe as possible. So that's kind of the perspective from the technology standpoint we've taken um, with things. And I hope over time, you know, even with Zoom, new security features have come online and hopefully we get to a place that um, that gets enhanced enough for us to be a little bit more open in the future as technology catches up with, with where we're at. And I've been in a meeting that has been Zoom bombed. And so all of our meetings we post on the web, they get picked up, especially public meetings and certain types of committees get picked up. And when you're Zoom bombed, it's a traumatizing event and, and it, or it can be a traumatizing event. It, you can't unsee things that you see, you can't unhear things that you've heard. And one of our mission, our missions as a public entity is to make sure people can conduct the town's business, the people's business in a safe environment. and. And I know people say, well, I'd like to see who's in the room like I can normally, but you don't get to see who's watching on Amherst Media or anything like that. Um, but I think that we have had people truly traumatized and um, by the kind of vile things that can be said and, and shown when you lose control of a meeting, which has happened multiple times with our community. 
And I'll just add one last thing to compared to other communities, you know, Amherst from day one has allowed live um, public comment and participation. And with all the risks that come along with that, that was important to us to make sure that we didn't lose that element. And some communities are still only accepting public comment via email or mm -hmm. before the meeting and, and not introducing any kind of live elements. Um, so in many ways, we we have been um, ahead of that for a long time. And some people are just coming online with live um, public comment and participation. Mm -hmm. So I am going to pull Lynn into the room. So if you could unmute Lynn, you're in the room. Yeah, I, first of all, I want to just compliment our IT staff for rising to the occasion and Brianna, mm -hmm. a part of that. Um, we, um, you know, we had to go slow within the first month until we just kind of ramped up and had all of the technology, technology that we did. And some committees were frustrated, but if right now we are literally full board, full ahead on all of our committee work. But one of the things that's interesting about this, and we'll all come back to this over time, and that is we've learned stuff through COVID. And one of the items on the council's agenda down the road is to talk about what should change about our meetings based on what we've learned once we return to in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. And how can we create the opportunity for participation using some of the technology that we've used for people who literally don't or cannot get to town hall and make public comment, but yet they would like to make public comment or they would like to participate as a panelist on a certain issue, but it's just not convenient for them to be there. So I think uh, in this case, technology and the use of technology during COVID, while all of us are a little bit zoomed out as we were, <laughs> uh, on the other hand, we've really learned some things and we need to incorporate that into how we think about moving forward with our meetings. That's a really good point, Lynn. And, and we've been thinking about this and discussing this and what's it going to look like when we're back to normal, quote unquote. Um, but I, from the IT perspective or this perspective that I take is that it probably is never going to be back to what it was. And we're going to have to come up with some sort of hybrid or new, new way of business. So um, it's important to think of those things now to prepare. So it's a really, really good point. Thank you. Yeah, I think Lynn and the council have set up a really strong standard on um, making announcements at the beginning of the meeting, what the protocol is for people announcing, making sure that Lynn checks in with every counselor to make sure that they can be heard and she, she can hear them. Um, and even if they take a break, they come back, she checks in with everybody again. She doesn't want anybody sitting there saying, well, I didn't hear a word you guys said. Um, I, I think that um, it's cumbersome because every vote has to be by, by a roll call. So each of those things, but then the council adjusted to that. They created a consent calendar so they don't have to take 20 votes on minutes and things that are just sort of pro forma things. Um, but yeah, I think the hybrid thing is gonna be interesting and in where technology plays because if we, what if half the counselors are in the room and half aren't? How does that look and how does that feel to people? I don't know. And yeah. And I, I will say there's a lot of exciting ways, um, you know, if the structure of meetings in the future allows for us to, to gather public input and participation in new ways to hear cool. from some new reticent voices that might not be able to, like Lynn said, be able to come, even if it's not in town hall, but might not be able to make that couple minute window for public comment. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of exciting things coming. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. We have two, two big things coming up that's gonna involve, a lot of things coming up that are gonna involve public participation. And what's that gonna look like? And for instance, we have the North Amherst Library renovations. We have the Hickory Ridge engagement process. Once we close on that piece of property, what's that, what, what should happen with that? We just got a grant yesterday for $1.5 million to work on the um, Pomeroy West Street intersection. And what should that look like? And it's all, you know, this is a town that engages the public. And so what's that going to look like? And I know, Brianna, you've dug into some alternative ways of sharing out information that doesn't, where you don't have to be in a room at a designated time, but there are other ways to engage. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. So in addition to whatever we have going on right now for our current process, we are bringing online a, a public participation platform, um, which is you know 100% online projects um, will we'll live there, projects and initiatives, and you can kind of interact with specific projects, subscribe to specific projects that you're interested in and just get updates on that or as many projects as you want. And built into the, the platform are all these, um, I guess, micro opportunities to engage and give your feedback that are outside of the public comment period of a specific meeting. Um, so over the lifespan of the project, we'll build in opportunities to, to um, poll community members, ask important questions, survey, have discussion boards, um, and then be able to, at the end of the day, because it's a, a cloud-based solution, have really solid data and analytics to, to compile with our, our more traditional methods of um, gathering public input and get a really rich, robust picture people think about a particular po project or initiative um, in ways that they can engage when they have time. Um, it might be at 10 p.m. they come in and do a, a five minute poll versus being able to attend you know, an entire couple hour forum. Um, so it's really gonna give a couple more rungs on that ladder of engagement and participation that we're always looking to, um, to do in town to expand and offer new ways for people to interact with us. Um, so, so that's, that's a company called bang the table and <laughs> <laughs> for, you know, I, I think it's a great name. Um, so we'll have a, you know, a, a custom branded engagement site for Amherst and you can interact on even, you know, more fun, easygoing photo contest type things, but into bigger projects like a master plan, for example, or the, uh, the Hickory Ridge project. So there'll be kind of like a buffet of things for people to come in and interact with in ways that they feel comfortable. And that should be coming online in the next couple of weeks to months, depending on um, how things go. So we'll, we'll, we'll do a big push and some announcement about that and maybe even do a meeting dedicated to, to it, to preview it to the public. One of the th things about the, the COVID-19 pandemic is it's forcing us to move quicker into areas. We've been looking at bang the table for a while, but then, um, but then it's like, well, wait a minute, we got to do something now. And it's moving us to do things online quicker than we normally would have. And that's a good thing. And the other advantage is, you know, we have this pot of CARES money that we can utilize for many of these initiatives. Um, and staff just have have been great at stepping up and saying, okay, now this, now that, let's keep moving and adjusting how we how we move projects forward. Yeah, and I, I'll just jump off on that, you know, with the work that I do, it's been it's been great, you know, it's a silver lining, I would say, in all of this is that we've been able to kind of really push the digital first and expand our offerings um, and services to our community members in different ways so that it's more convenient for them. And um, everybody's on board and department heads are excited about bringing things online. So it's it's an interesting time, I think. All right, I'm gonna give another call to the room to see if they have any um, questions. We're coming up to the hour. So if you have a question, please pop it into the Q&A or raise your hand, star nine from a phone. Um, we'd be happy to hear from you live. So I don't see any hands or anything in the chat yet, but I'm gonna give folks another minute. Um, anything that any of our guests um, have going on that they wanted to share that they didn't get asked yet? Well, I'll just do a shout out to Sarah Marshall, who's in the room. Uh, I think CPA made a lot of progress last night um, in, in reviewing projects and Sarah chaired that committee this year and I've been to a few meetings and she's done a really good job bringing along new members and, and running a very, um, very nice process to consider all the projects. Um, I don't know if Sarah wants to give any, any, uh, um, information about some of those projects that were discussed last night, but if not, I'm sure it'll be coming up soon. Have they finished their work or are they still more work to do? I think they have one more meeting, um, maybe two. I'm not sure if, if it'll be wrapped up completely at the last, the next meeting. Wow. That's efficient. That's good. Well, they did a great job. Sarah says, thank you, Sean. Um, <laughs> she, she'd rather wait till her, their report is final before she um, mm -hmm. gives any updates, but she, she did ask, um, 
she was out of the room for just a quick moment and was wondering what the status of Hickory Ridge is. So Hickory Ridge is still in, uh, we have a purchase and sale agreement with with Hickory, with the owners of Hickory Ridge. Um, there are a couple things we're still working through on the actual uh, close in, in order to close on the property. Um, you know, several weeks away sh still from that because they're just, whenever you're uh, doing a transaction, it's a very complicated transaction because there's a solar um, array that is gonna be part of the development that the current owners want to maintain and sort of like, what does that really look like and how, how are they access that and things like that. Um, but it's a, it's a, you know, everybody knows it's a wonderful piece of property. It'll be, it's a great purchase for the town. Um, and so that will, that will happen. Uh, we have a willing seller <clears throat> in the town, the town council has approved the project. So we're, we are a willing buyer. So it's just a matter of getting all of the sort of details. All, we're just doing all the due diligence we have to do before we purchase a, a piece of land for the, for the town, including 21 E things and all those things that you typically would do to make sure that the ownership is legit. And, you know, uh, we are very careful when we purchase a piece of land, but it will happen. I'm very confident of that. And that's a perfect project that we'll probably have in our on our public participation platform. So, mm -hmm. so stay tuned. All right, any more questions from the room? Um, final, final chance here for today at least. All right, I don't see any hands or any questions. So um, any, any parting uh, words or statements or things that you wanna leave people with for Paul or Sonia or Sean? Thank you. Um, I look forward to, to doing one of these out at a, out in public at some point ever since I've started. They've been the virtual kind, which is not bad. Um, it'll be nice to actually get out there at some point. Um, and if there are any financial questions or budget questions, um, we're always willing, we always want to be there to answer them for you. So um, don't hesitate to reach out. And you can find budget information, like Sean said earlier, by going to our homepage and clicking budget or Amherst MA gov slash budget new documents are getting added there all the time by Sean and his team and um, there's a budget feedback button so feel free to send questions that are budget related that way too anybody Sonia? else what's for Thanksgiving Sonia what's for thanks turkey Sonia's a very good cook she's already made, made a couple things for the office since I've been here so <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you. Um, thank you all. We will be putting this recording up on our community chat playlist um, in case you want to refer back to it or share with a friend. If you uh, want to follow up with us, feel free to send an email at info at amherstma.gov and we will um, connect with you there. Thank you all. Have Thanks, a great everybody. day. Yeah, have a good Thanksgiving.